Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're with uh, continuing with our series of YouTube videos on helping you play chess better. We've spent a lot of my videos on the thought process, which was one of the things that I, you know, specialize in. And today is no exception to that. Those videos seem to be pretty popular. And today I'd like to talk about the differences between solving a puzzle and finding a move in a game and how Dutch researcher Adrian de Groot came up with a way of giving good players exercises to figure out what's the right way to find positions in games. So let's start with a puzzle. This is a puzzle I picked out of a tactics book and it's white to play and mate in three. The way you think when you're doing puzzles is considerably different than how you think in games. In a puzzle, you're given a requirement, and the requirement restricts you on what you can do. So for instance here, since it's white to play in mate in three, any kind of sequence that doesn't involve black's king can probably pretty much be eliminated. For instance, white's not going to play a move like knight to c7 to save his knight from being taken on d5 and to try to attack the rook on e8. Those are the kind of moves you'll look at in a regular game with a regular position. But when you know it's a mate in three, and it's that requirement, you're going to look at only moves that might possibly lead to mate. Okay, well here, black white's only got a few of those. He could play knight e7 check. Every check is a possibility, is a candidate move. He could play queen takes h7 check, ditto. He can play h takes g5, threatening queen h7 mate. And he can play knight takes g5, threatening queen h7 mate. Those are the only moves that are at all likely to lead to a checkmate in three. And when you're doing this, you're going to start with the most forcing move, which is queen takes h7 check. Now, you might say, well, giving away your queen, what's the chances that you're going to mate them? Well, that's what puzzles are for. They like to sell books by showing you positions where you can sacrifice your queen. So let's take a look, see if it works. Queen takes h7 check. King takes h7 is the only legal move. And now we can play h takes g5 discovered check. And black has two legal moves. He could play king g6 or king g8. But on both those moves, knight e7 is checkmate. So therefore, that's the answer to the puzzle. Queen h7 check, king h7, h takes g5, discover check with the rook on h1, king moves to g6 or g8, knight e7 is mate, for instance, on g6, Knight e7 is mate because the pawn on g5 is now guarding the f6 square, if you can visualize that. And the knight on e7 is guarding the f5 square. So, and the rook, of course, is guarding the h file. The knight on f3 is guarding the pawn on g5. So we've got all the squares covered and it's checkmate. So, you know, it's pretty easy in a sense to do puzzles because you, what you're looking at is a lot more restricted. But, but what do you do to find moves in a game? No one ever teaches lower rated players to do this when they start out. They just have to, you know, work their way through the jungle themselves. But about 80 years ago, a Dutch researcher named Adrian de Groot decided he was going to write a PhD thesis on how you should actually find moves in a chess game or how good players do, which is the same thing. Uh, before we get into what happened with de Groot, I have to tell you a story from a couple weeks ago. I bought his book, Thought and Choice in Chess, about 50 years ago, and he spells his name D-E space G-R-O-O-T, which in English, of course, we would pronounce de Groot, because G-R-O-O-T, O-O-T would be root, like R-O-O-T is root. So I've for 50 years, I've pronounced his name de Groot, and I've even written a book myself to follow up on his book, uh, his book is Thought and Choice in Chess. My book is called The Improving Chess Thinker, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the video. But I've always called him De Groot. And about two weeks ago, I was mentioning him, I guess, in one of my videos, and someone from the Netherlands was listening to my video, and they heard me pronounce it that way, and they dropped me a note and said, uh, Dan, uh, that's not how it's pronounced in Dutch. Uh, D-E-G-R-O-T -D is pronounced like De Groot not De Groot. So here I am, I've mispronounced the name. It's just like my name is Heisman, and I'm related to the Heisman Trophy. My great-grandfather, uh, 
Aaron Heisman. His first cousin was John Heisman, the football coach. And we, John Heisman left the endowment for the Heisman Trophy. And everybody in our family pronounces the name Heisman. But people who don't know our family see the one S and think, well, in German, that's probably a Z sound. So they mispronounce it Heisman. So you watch TV and they say, who's going to win the Heisman Trophy this year? Which makes my ears cringe a little bit because it's the Heisman Trophy. And we've actually been to the Heisman Trophy dinner. We've talked to the Heisman Trophy people. One of the members of our family actually asked the guy on ESPN, <laughs> you know, when you have the show, could you please pronounce it the Heisman Trophy? And he said, well, why would I want to do that? Anyway, so just like they mispronounced our name, Heisman, uh, they mispronounced, I mispronounced DeGroote's name and I was calling him DeGroote. So I'll, I'll try during this video to call him De DeGroote. Anyway, so what Adrian DeGroote did was he was lucky enough that the AVRO tournament in 1938 had been held in the Netherlands. And a lot of the strong players from around the world were in that area during that time. And what he did was he went to some of his games and he got interesting positions from his games. And he gave them to the um, grandmasters and also to some strong IMs and, you know, other master type players. And he said to them, okay, I'm doing a research on how people find moves. What I'd like to do is give you some interesting positions from games. These are not puzzles. These are just regular game positions. And I'd like you to pretend you're playing in a slow tournament. And I'm going to write down, I'm going to have a person here, a stenographer, who's going to write down everything that you say. I guess this is before they probably had too many tape recorders. And we're going to capture everything you say we want you to find the move just like you would in a game but we want you to think out loud so that we can record everything and then i'm going to write a research paper on how people do this so he took a bunch of good players a lot of grandmasters a few ims some other masters and he gave them positions from his games and he said think out loud for me and i'm going to write down what you did and then i'm going to write a paper about this and his paper became this book which is really more of a psychology book than it is a chess book called Thought and Choice in Chess. And I read this book when I was, got to be about 18 or 1900, I guess maybe around 1900 I bought it. And uh, I found it really interesting and I've been giving people these DeGroote exercises ever since. So usually when people get to the third or fourth lesson, if they take a bunch of lessons from me, I'll start to give them DeGroote exercises every once in a while. Uh, I'll give them a, a position, maybe some of the very same ones that DeGroote used in his book, or I'll give them some that I've seen in interesting positions um, in games since then, and I'll have them think out loud and, and you know, find a move for me out loud. Uh, the instructions I give people are as follows. One, pretend you're playing in a slow game. You've got lots of time on your clock. You're not in any kind of time trouble, but you don't have an infinite amount of time. Two, Use algebraic notation. Don't say, I can take that pawn, because that might be ambiguous. There might be six pawns you could take. Please say knight takes f7 or bishop takes b5 check or whatever. Uh, three, it's going to take about twice as long to do a DeGroote exercise as it does to find a move in a regular game because you're thinking out loud and I'm throwing you into the position cold. And for most people, those two things roughly equate to a two-to-one time expansion. So, for instance, if you were playing a tournament game at 40 and 2, and you had an hour and 26 minutes left on your clock, and you reached a degrowth position, and it took you five minutes to find a move at the World Open, it would take you 10 minutes to find the same move in a degrowth exercise because you're speaking out loud and not thinking quietly, and you have to evaluate the position when you start. That's the third instruction. The next instruction is please don't show off for the exercise. So the, the reason for that is sometimes I give people these exercises and they don't do what they normally do in games. They, they show off for the exercise. They either play way too fast or way too slow, more likely way too slow. I once had someone who never took more than about 17 seconds on a move, no matter what the time limit was. And I did, gave him a degrowth position and I told him, please don't show off for the exercise. Just do what you would do in a normal game. And he went on for about 35 minutes trying to find a move. And I had never seen him think for more than like 17 seconds on a move before. And finally, I stopped him and I said, are you sure this is what you do on every move and every slow game you've ever played? This is exactly the process you go through. And he said, of course not. 
So his of course not meant, of course I'm not following your instructions. You know, you can't help people get a better thought process if when they're doing a degrowth, they're using a different thought process than they would, you know, if they were playing a game. You're trying to help them get better on what they normally do. So if they do different things when they're doing a degrowth, it doesn't help nearly as much. Um, another one of my instructions for a degrowth is whatever you don't say can be held against you, which simply means that you're supposed to say everything that's going through your head. If you don't say everything that's going through your head, and later on at the end we say, hmm, maybe you should have done X, and the person says to me, well, I did do X, I just didn't say it. Of course I believe them. I'm, I'm sure my students are telling the truth. But what's the point? I can only really grade them on, on what they're doing because they're supposed to be kind of babbling, you know, as they go, sort of a stream of consciousness. And finally, when they're, when they're done, I need them to, to make a move and hit the clock. Well, if they're live at my house... They can actually do that, but if, they're, if we're doing it over the internet and we're using Skype or a phone to, to talk, then I need to know when they're done, so I tell them, you know, make your move, and in, since you can't hit a clock, just say push clock or hit clock, and then I know that you're done. So that's the kind of instructions that I give people for the DeGroat exercise. All right, let's, uh, let's pull up a DeGroat from DeGroat's book. Let's pull up what's called DeGroat B. Hold on a second. Got to type this in on my ICC here. One. Oh, that's not the one. Examine percent two. All right, here we go. DeGroat C, I guess this is. Yep. All right, so this is a position with black to play that's a DeGroat. Uh, it's a, it's an, DeGroat, uh, DeGroat positions are exactly like positions from games. They could have one single best move. They could have many moves that are equally good the person who's moving could be winning they could be dead drawn they could be losing it's just like a regular game it's not like a puzzle and you're just trying to find the best move that you can you're not trying to solve some sort of puzzle as if this is the winning idea or something so de Groot was careful to try to give people positions that were interesting but but hopefully not too puzzle like because that would be a whole different ballgame, as we talked about at the start of the video. So here we have DeGroat um, C, C as in cat. And if you'd like to do it yourself, what you can do is stop the video and pretend you're black. If you want to do it out loud and you want to record yourself with a recording device, fine. If you have a friend who can write down what you're saying, fine. If you just want to do it quietly in your head, since nobody's around, and find the best move you can, great. If you don't want to do any of that and you just want to continue with the video, fine, do that, don't pause the video. But if you want to play along with the game a little bit, you can pause the video and try to see, pretend you're in a slow game and find the best move you can for black in this position. In fact, let me flip the board because a lot of people watching the video don't like to do things upside down. Okay, same position, board is flipped. It's Black's turn, and the question is, what move would you play for Black? You know, not a puzzle, you know, think out loud, see what your move is. All right, so pause the video now and do that if you want. If you don't, let's continue. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read you world champion Max Owa doing this position for DeGroat in 1939, 80 years ago. And because they translated this book into English, they also, since books in the 1960s were written in, out in English descriptive notation, his notation is in English descriptive, but I realize most people watching the video would not like it if I read English descriptive. So I'm going to try to translate into algebraic as fast as I can. Uh, so forgive me if I make a mistake doing the translation while I'm reading. Uh, also, for this particular po uh, DeGroat position, De Groot asked asked Ua to look at the position blind look at the position for 10 seconds and then he took it away from him and he asked him questions about it which was a separate you know psychological test he wanted to do with Ua and I'm not going to read you what Ua said about the position in the first 10 seconds because he's doing it blindfolded I'm going to talk I'm going to read you what he said once they gave him the position back and said all right now that you've you've done that Here's the position, you know, find the move that you would play. And I'm going to read you what 
Dr. Max Owa said. He said, all right, now the move d5 is rather beastly. No, then I would rather sacrifice on uh, e6. His knight on f3 is sort of hanging. I might play knight to e4. Or have I to... Hmm. No, I'm... I needn't fear him playing d5, um, not after, even after he plays bishop takes e6 check. Uh, I just take the uh, d pawn off on d5. All right, so after knight e4, at first sight, it's a nice little move. By capturing on, um, on e6, he only helps me develop. For that matter, I would only be pleased if he took. My rook comes into play with gain of tempo, but maybe he'll play knight to g5 after he plays bishop takes e6 check, and then queen takes e6 check in reply would win the exchange. That's going a little far. Let's look for a move. Can I start something there? Let's say I look at queen to e4. No, I must guard my pawn on uh, c7. If I play queen e4, queen takes e4, knight takes e4, Knight takes c7. Um, then let's see. Can I play rook takes f3? Can I demolish him then? Oh, yes, I can. That's quite good. Okay, so queen e4 is not bad. But after queen e4, he could just play rook on h to e1. And then if I exchange, and then he takes my pawn on c7 as weak. And also the one on e6. No, that endgame is not favorable for me. How about knight e4 again? That's not unattractive. Knight e4. He could play knight takes c7. Is that such a combination? Knight e4, knight takes c7. Then I could play knight to c3, winning a piece. Um, yes. All right. If he plays bishop takes e6 check, then I just play king h8. All right. So after knight e4, knight takes c7 doesn't look like it's a go. Knight e4 is a good little move for the time being. Hmm. I don't have, do not have many threats. Well, knight takes c7 is a threat. The, can he annoy me? Knight, knight takes c7. No, that cannot be done. The queen is tied down and the knight cannot do anything. And if he plays d5, I can just take it. All right, fine. I, I think I'm going to play knight to e4. Okay, so he hits the clock. And that took... That world champion Ua, um, seven minutes to do that to find his move knight e4. Now this is a position that even fools grandmasters. It's 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 quite a tricky position. If you give it to a computer, it's going to tell you all kinds of crazy things. We can do that right now, just to see how Max Ua did. Let let me bring the board up, shrink it a little bit, and bring in the analysis. Let's show the top three or four moves here. Okay, so Stockfish 10 is thinking right now, and at uh, 20 ply, he has the move h6 and the move bishop d7 as his top two moves. Notice that h6 and bishop d7, neither were moves that world champion Oa even considered. Now he's got knight e4 also at 0, 0, 0 at 23 ply. So the, the computer thinks that h6, bishop d7, and knight e4 are almost all equally good. So whether whether you play h6 or bishop d7 or knight e4, these are equally good moves. And again, you know, in a real game, and now he's got a fourth move that's 0, 0, 0, which is rook e8. So he's got 0, 0, 0 across the board here right now. And, you know, in a real game, you, you very often, unlike a puzzle where there should only, if it's a good puzzle, there's only going to be right one right answer. In a game, very often you do have Multiple moves that are equally good. Now he's dropped rook e8 back down again as 0.47 for white. Again, we're, we're looking for black's move, so we're looking for the number that's the lowest positive number or, or the highest negative number. And right now he's got Dr. Owa's move, knight e4, bishop d7, and h6, two moves that Dr. Owa didn't consider as all um, equally good. And now e5 at 27 ply has moved up into fourth place at 0.09, meaning that if you play e5 here, uh, you're not far off the best move. e5 is a perfectly reasonable move too. 
All right, so that's what Dr. Owen did, uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. DeGroat did, is he had, you know, Alexander L. Yakin and Owa and uh, Salo Flor and Ruben Fine, you know, people like that, go through a bunch of interesting positions and think out loud for him in finding a move. Now E5 is also at 0, 0, 0 at 28 ply. Okay, so it turns out this position is fairly equal at fairly good depths here, but, it, and, and a lot of the grandmasters came up with different moves for that reason. All right, let's bring the board back again. I don't have time to summarize De Groot's book. I did talk to you about his exercise, but basically one of the big things I learned from reading his book is that strong players spend a lot of their time comparing moves. You know, if they have a move A and they think their opponent's gonna make move B or, or move B is dangerous, you know, they'll look at A, B, C, where C is their next move, and they'll try to figure out how good is position C, the position after move C. They'll say, if I do A, and he does B, and I do C, do I like that? And then they'll compare, and they'll say, all right, well, I don't have to do A. Suppose I do X, and he does something like Y, where Y, again, is a very reasonable move. Weaker players very often can't find a good Y, but, you know, grandmasters can. So they say, well, if I play X, and he plays, let's say, Y, and I do Z, I could get to position Z prime. Do I like Z prime better than, a lot, than I like C prime? And they spend a lot of time comparing it. And one of the, he, he Dr. DeGroote named the steps of the procedures that good players used in most uh, analytical positions. We're not talking about positions like, you know, on the first move of the game, if someone plays a non-book move like A3, what do you do? That's not a very analytical position. We're talking about analytical positions like the one on the board in front of us right now. And he said, and he kind of named the steps of what they did. And we talked about this earlier in my two videos that I did earlier. One's called um, uh, Thought Process, The Five Essential Steps. And the other one was Thought Process, What Process. And we talked about some of the common ingredients. And that's what Owa was talking about. And one of the steps near the end, he called Striving for Proof. And I always ask my students, what were the students, what are the grandmasters trying to prove when they strive for proof? Because this is quite different than what weaker players do when they think out loud. And what they do when they're striving for proof is they're trying to prove that their move is at least as good as any other move that they could play. They're trying to compare their move with all the alternatives to see that the position they could reach is at least as good as the position they could reach with another move. This kind of comparison is a key to being having a good thought process when you're not comparing things and you're just trying to prove that the move you're looking at is good. Now, that works perfectly well if you have a mate in two or something. You don't need to compare anything. You just have to see if it's really a mate. But most moves aren't mate in two. Most moves, you're trying to find the best move you can in a reasonable time around. And the best move you can in a reasonable amount of time means comparing it to other ideas. <clears throat> All right, in the last couple minutes, I'd like to talk about my book. My book's called The Improving Chess Thinker. And just like Jeremy Silman's book, uh, the, his uh, Silman's Endgame course, the middle of my book is organized by classes. What I did was I gave examples of, let's say, about a dozen, you know, 12 to 15 examples from each class of how people thought with a various number of DeGroote positions. So each person had one degree position, and I'd have, a, I'd have a section on class F and below, and I'd show 12, let's say 12 different thought processes from people rated below 1,000, and I'd talk about them. Then the next chapter is class E for 1,000 to 1,200, and I'd show another dozen protocols. A protocol is a degree exercise written down. I'd show a, a dozen people thinking about a various degree positions, and, I'd ex and after they would, I would show what they thought, I would write down my comments on what they did and what they didn't do. Then my next chapter was Class D. And again, we took a dozen people or so, and we showed their DeGroote exercises and what they thought of Class D. Then I had a section on Class C. Then I had another s section on Class B. Then I had another section on Class A. And then finally, I had a section on Expert and Above, and I went all the way up to International Master, and I, I thank the IMs who helped me. For instance, uh, International Master Greg Shahadi, 
uh, was one of my subjects who did it for my book. I don't mention any names in the book. I, I'm sure Greg doesn't mind me mentioning his name. But if you're a low-class player, you know, you don't want me giving your degrowed and then giving your name in the book. You, you, you might not be appreciative of that. So I just said, you know, it's a class C player. And I would go through and I would show you their different degrowed protocols and what they thought. And you could compare. And what you can do in the book is you can do the degrowths yourself. And then you can work your way up through the book and see as players get better and better how their thought process improves. You can see, gee, if I'm, a, if I'm a B player, what do other B players think? What differentiates me from an A player? Well, if I get this book, I can see what B players think, but then I can read the next section and see what A players think and see what makes them better than me. What do I need to do to get to the next level? I could have called the name of this book, What Do I Need to Do to Get to the Next Level? I guess maybe that would have sold more books. But I called it the Improving Chess Thinker, which is actually uh, won't sell as many books, but it's probably a better name for the book because I not only give the DeGroats, but I also have sections here on, you know, what a thought process entails and what are good thought processes and bad thought processes and, you know, things like that. So I tried to cover the whole gamut of soup to nuts for thinking in my book, The Improving Chess Thinker, and not just give the DeGroats, which is the middle of the book. Okay, so today we've talked about thought process again. We have talked about the wonderful groundbreaking research that Adrian DeGroat did on his exercises. We've talked about the fact that I've given these exercises out for, I hate to say it, almost over 50 years. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. But anyway, I've probably done more DeGroat exercises than anybody that ever lived because I've been doing it that long. And uh, that's why I wrote a book about it. I thought it would be interesting for people to see what I learned from doing all those degraded exercises. And they could learn it too. All right, so for my YouTube series, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, you can subscribe. I'm planning on giving away a free lesson to some random subscriber um, when I get to 1,000. Uh, last time I checked, I was around 940 or 950. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll get up to 1,000. So pass the word to your friends. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do it. I'll probably have to have some sort of email contact where people can email me and I'll have a 48-hour window to pick out a random email or the best email or something to give out a lesson to celebrate the 1,000 subscribers. So if you can help me with that, great. If not, I understand. We'll see you next time. Bye.